For this 14th lecture in our second series, we're back in the late Ming, that exciting time of controversy and change and masters of striking originality. Some of them, such as Wu Bin and Zhang Hong, have been undervalued in traditional Chinese writings. And others, like the subject of this lecture, Chen Rongshou, have had a lot written about them, but not much that seems to me really to the point, at least as it's seen by one modern and foreign art historian, that is myself. Lots of biographical stuff, lots of work done from texts, not much that's based on looking at his paintings virtually nothing that tries to interpret their expressive subtleties. This lecture is about a few of Chen Rongzhou's many surviving paintings, and it will also be about people I've known who have been somehow involved with him and his paintings, such as collectors or dealers or as museum people or in some other capacity. I myself have been deeply engaged with Chen Rongzhou from early in my career. Our first seminar exhibition at UC Berkeley, that is, The Restless Landscape of 1971 to 72, uh, included five of his paintings, the exhibition did. And other exhibitions and publications that I've worked on include quite a few more, maybe 30 or so in all. He was a prolific artist. There's a lot about him in Chinese literature, as I say. And his paintings raise lots of interesting problems, not only stylistic. Uh, first images, please. I begin with a poor image pulled from the website of our Berkeley Art Museum, where the painting is now, of this very familiar work. Many of you will know it. Why is it so familiar? It's a genuine and fine work, but it's hardly one of the most striking or the most significant among Chen Rongzhou's works. It was owned by Victoria Kontag, part of the collection she put together during her years in Shanghai in the 1940s. Um, Her collection was stored at the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City, uh, looked after by her old friend Larry Sickman, Lawrence Sickman. And, and Sickman, when he came to write the, his part of the textbook titled The Art and Architecture of China, reproduced it and wrote about it there. And since that's the textbook that we used for many years in teaching Chinese art history, and slides for all the works in it were easily available, Uh, and so were, there were in many uh, university side libraries, we all thought of it as Chen Rongshou's typical work. When the Kontag sale uh, to Brundage failed and her paintings were dispersed, we acquired this one for our Berkeley, or uh, then called University Art Museum, now Berkeley Art Museum. I won't talk about the painting now because I don't have good slides, maybe in a future lecture because this certainly won't be the last one to treat Chen Hongzhou and his paintings. Next. Three paintings by him were in my Fantastics and Eccentrics exhibition of 1967. Uh, he was written about in the Restless Landscape catalog, mostly by Stella Lee, uh, seen here in her essay on late Ming figure painting, although we did include one landscape. She wrote, as in all her writing, with lots of original perceptions and supplied information that the scholar with girl servants, for instance, bears a signature that he began using only in 1646, but it must be a late work. She was very smart and was and still is a terrific writer. Next. I put on this group photo taken at one of my birthday celebrations with a group of my former students, only to call attention to the person at the far left, standing somewhat apart and wearing glasses. This is Wei Kun Tang, And I seem to have no other photo of him easily accessible. And I use him to introduce another seminar and another book, the one titled The Painter's Practice, How Artists Lived and Worked in Traditional China. Uh, the seminar was held in the early 1990s, and the book was published in 1994. Wei Kun Tang was a principal participant in that, and he worked hard afterwards to help me in organizing all the diverse materials that had been collected by him and the others. Uh, so that I can make the lectures and a book out of them. He has also recently worked long and hard revising and correcting the Chinese translation of that book, which is just now, January 2012, appeared in Chinese. So tell your Chinese friends to buy copies. Next. Quite a few Chen Hongshou paintings are cited in this book, and 
incidents from his life, because he is, among other artists, especially well-recorded. On page 109 of that book, I reproduced these three works by Chun and used them to make points about how Chinese studio artists used family members and assistants, who are named in Chun's inscriptions on these, to help with the coloring, filling in fabric patterns, and other workshop jobs, and also how a painter of this kind might make multiple copies of a composition for sale to people who needed them for celebrations or for presentations or uh, uh, presentations of birthdays or weddings, for instance. The immortal presenting gifts, which is the subject of, of these paintings, would be appropriate for either one. And this tells us one basic thing about Chen Hongshou, that he was such an artist who used uh, followers or helpers uh, who fulfilled commissions, who turned out functional paintings in numbers uh, for sale to his customers. Uh, in short, he was a thoroughgoing uh, pro pro professional artist. And if you believe that a painter of this sort couldn't really produce great paintings, think again. Or as I've said before, go join that other lecture room down the hall. Next, please. Once more, I show a group photograph to call attention to the person at far left. This time, along with myself and Howard Marianne Rogers, sitting and drinking tea on the veranda of some Japanese villa, it's Anne Burkus, now Anne Burkus Chasson, who took her doctorate with me and teaches now at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. She took on Chun Hong Shou for her doctoral dissertation topic, and she wrote a terrific multi-volume work on him, with masses of translation and other information, uh, as well as all the fruits of her very acute mind. But, alas, she has never reworked it for publication, as I've been urging her to do for decades. Next, please. I put Anne on screen to introduce another story about a Chun Hung Shou painting. Uh, I was on the East Coast with a group of my students, and I arranged for some of them to come with me to C.C. C. Wong's apartment, where we asked him to show us all the Chun Hung Shou paintings that he had. And this one came out, among others. It's hanging against the background of his closet in this uh, image. And Anne went for it immediately and convinced me, which wasn't hard, about how good and important it was. And I ended up trading something that Wong wanted for it and getting it as my own. I think it's still in the Berkeley Art Museum. It represents the meeting between two generals of the Han Dynasty, Su Wu and Li Ling. Okay, now I'm going to read um, from my Distant Mountains book about these paintings. Here we go. Painting that could be roughly dated to the same period that is the late 1630s by its style, style and its inscription is Chen Hong Shou's Meeting of Su Wu and Li Ling. Li Ling was a Han Dynasty, uh, second century BC general who, when he was captured by the Huns, transferred his allegiance to the Hunnish Khan, whose daughter he married. His old friend Su Wu was sent out on a peace mission to the Huns. Uh, when his companions went over to the Khan service, he refused to join them, and as punishment, he was sent to the bleak northern regions to herd sheep. Li Ling was dispatched to make a last attempt to persuade him to renounce his Chinese loyalism, but he failed. The theme especially is depicted in the, uh, in the poignant last meeting of the two friends, became an established image of loyalist integrity. A depiction of it by Li Gong Lin was inscribed by the late Song loyalist martyr Wan Tung Xiang, well, excuse me, Wan Tian Xiang, and Zhao Meng Fu, whose own career was painfully involved with the loyalist issue, may have alluded to it in one of his paintings and so forth. Uh, that's all for that thing. But then on the next page, I write this about the, about the painting itself. The four figures in the painting stand in an arc close to the picture plane like actors on a stage. At the left is Su Wu, holding a shepherd's staff with multicolored tassels. Li Ling stands in profile in the foreground. Behind him, an attendant wearing military garb with a purse and dagger slung from his waistband holds a standard with the design of a dragon in the clouds, emblem of the Chinese emperor, and here by reverse implication of Li Ling's disloyalty. Another attendant completes the group, 
clasping a cylindrical object with both arms. Li Ling wears a soldier's hat and belt with sword and jacket with lotus insignia. Su Wu's costume is of coarse material and is tied with a simple cloth sash. Several large holes reveal his undergarments, and his toe is exposed by a hole in his one boot. Chen Hongshou's typical drapery drawing of this period, derived ultimately from archaic conventions, including the John B or tremulous brushstroke manner, which Sui Chujung was using for another effect around this time, uh, here renders the rumpling and creasing of thick cloth and suggests the hard outdoor life of the, of the participants. Both Tzu Wu and Li Ning hold their hands raised to their faces. The gestures are ambivalent. On the simpler level, we are to understand that they are blowing on their hands for warmth. But with our knowledge of the situation, we cannot avoid reading Li Ling's gesture as one of hiding his face in shame, and Su Wu's as part of his whole physical expression of painfully mixed feelings, as he is pulled by the old friend, his old friendship while recoiling in distaste from Li's proposal. The attendant at right, sensitive to the indignity of his master's position, turns his face away and rolls his eyes upward. The tableau is emotionally affecting, at the same time that the oddness of the drawing and the theatricality of the poses stress its artificiality. The expressiveness is too intense to ring quite true. That's the end of the passage I'm quoting from the book. Next, please. This is another hand scroll painted by Chen Hongshou with the help of two other artists, a portrait of a man named Ho Tian Zhang sitting in his garden together with his wife or concubine and a small servant playing a flute. I published it twice and also used it in my Getty lectures for different purposes in the painter's practice book. I use it to write about the use of studio assistants. Chen Hongshou himself painted only the figures in it, leaving it for his disciple Yen Zhang to do the setting. And a third painter, presumably a portrait specialist, was brought in to paint the face of the, of the main figure. In my compelling image book, in the chapter titled Portraits of Real People and Others, I used it to discuss that distinction, which isn't so simple, between real portraits of real people and pictures of imagined people, as Ho Tian Zhang and his concubine were. In my Getty lectures on Ming Ching paintings of women, I used it to show how the woman in a painting of this kind, even if she represents a real individual, is often reduced to a type, not shown as an individual. Moreover, she makes a positive commentary on the man's continuing virility by holding up a fan with a blossoming plum branch on it. The ability of old plum trees to continue blossoming into old age was a common symbol for that. I cite these three readings now only to make my often made point about how good Chinese paintings, like good Western paintings, are polysemous, have many meanings, that is. That's a word I haven't used for decades, and I'm not partial to such heavy Latin terms, but I, it seems appropriate here. Next, please. Chen Hong Cho did, however, do at least one portrait of a real woman, and presumably others as well. This one, which he painted in 1637, of a woman I haven't identified, I know only from a reproduction. I think it's in the Zhejiang Provincial Museum. The section of my Getty Lectures was devoted to real and imaginary portraits of women. I must put those lectures with their illustrations on my website, since it's highly unlikely now that they will ever be published in book form, as was my original intention. Next. We turn next to a major Chen Hongshou painting and a major controversy surrounding it. This is the work that he painted, at least I think he painted, in 1635, titled A Tall Pine and Taoist Immortal, representing the artist himself and his nephew in the landscape setting. I reproduced it in color and discussed it at length in both my Distant Mountains and my Compelling Image books. It has been for me one of the most fascinating and expressively complex of Chinese paintings. To judge it fairly and interpret it at some length has been a challenge for me. Next. But its authenticity has not gone unchallenged. Wang Guo Wang 
seen here in a, is a notable doubter. As I recounted in one of my addenda to the first, uh, first series, uh, the one about the 1999 Authenticity Symposium at the Metropolitan Museum, Wang Go was one of the two people brought in by Wen Fong to add to the overwhelmingly anti kl forces who dominated that symposium, or at least were intended to. Next. His paper argues that the painting is impossible as a genuine Chanung Shou and must be a forgery. I won't try to summarize his argument, which uses both visual uh, observations and textual problems, to try to prove his case. Those of you seriously interested can read it in the symposium volume and judge for yourselves, especially after I show and talk about the painting. Wang Go, old friend, sometimes adversary, uh, is the descendant by several generations of the distinguished Qing Dynasty statesman Wang Tung He, 1830 to 1904, and he inherited his collection of Chinese paintings. He's also a maker of educational films. Several works by Chan Hung Shou were in his inherited collection, and he took on the role of a specialist scholar of the artist, compiling a three-volume collection of plates of his works with text. He, of course, is partial to paintings that were in his own collection, as anyone would be, and suspicious of many others. I think he was quite wrong about the 1635 self-portrait, and I will now show it and talk about it as a genuine and fascinatingly complex work by this great artist. Chen Hung Shou's inscription, written in the upper right, reads, Master Lotus and Nephew Han have been roaming at ease for days on end. In spring we have been intoxicated by the beauty of peach blossoms. In autumn we have contemplated the charm of the hibiscus. In summer we have stumbled through thick growths of pine. In late winter we have made verses about the whiteness of snow. In all things we looked after each other, leafing through numerous books, feeling doubly relaxed in spirit, practicing pure talk and sketching pines and rocks. If these words accord somewhat with the Tao, why should we feel ashamed to eat the three meals? And I go on to explain. The cryptic last line alludes to a passage in the Taoist Book of Zhuangzi, which points out that a man traveling only to the suburbs with, with enough food for three meals comes back with his stomach full, while one setting out on a thousand-mile journey must carry enough provisions for three months. If one's excursions are modest, that is, one's needs will be also modest. Chun adds the date, the spring of 1635, and his signature. I've written so much about this painting, and my argument about it is so complex, and I'm not going to try to repeat it here. You can read it in my books at the library if you don't own them. Uh, it will be enough for the present purpose to make relatively brief comments as I show the slides. Okay, next. Chun's nephew takes on the role of the boy servant, who nearly always accompanies the noble scholar in old paintings of this kind of subject. Uh, but his face is more individualized, maybe caricaturing the real ne nephew's face. And he has flowers stuck into his hat, and also into the top of the covered basket that he carries, perhaps containing their provisions for their travels. He seems to hold another object, maybe a bottle of wine and the other arm, hidden behind him. Beyond that, I'll say only that the combination of high aesthetic refinement and mock heavy-handedness in the drawing is not the work of a forger. I would pretty much stake my reputation on that. Next. The same is true of the landscape setting. Chan Hung Shou uses a compositional device that was not uncommon in landscapes of the time, as I became aware in all my engagements with them over the decades, the device of mismatching the recessions at left and right, with the distant hills marking the horizon much higher on one side of a central mass, here are the trees, than the other. And the same is true of the painting of the rocks, made to look as though they were carved out of wood, and of the pleasant absurdity of the lined up red leaves along the edge of the tree, each almost readable as a little smiley face. Uh, Chun draws the dian or dots on top of the rocks in the old traditional way, with a black blob with a touch of mineral green in the center of each one. Next. Here are the rocks and rapids at left of the figure. We can see the edge of his head on the lower right. My basic argument, to oversimplify it, 
is that Chun is doing a wry parody of the debased landscape style practiced by too many artists of his time and place, the great old Zhejiang region, where a painting had flourished for centuries and where this kind of painting had fallen into sharp decline. Chen Dongshou was an educated and highly cultivated man who had attempted an official career and failed. He belonged, that is, to that great class of failed literati who produced much of the finest literature and art of the Ming. And he was forced by circumstance to live as a painter and to use styles and subjects that the market demanded. How he managed to transcend that bad situation is a subject basis to any serious study of Chen Hongshou. Next. And here at last we see him in a detail, standing in a mock noble scholar pose at the center of this extraordinary picture, wrapped up in himself and yet projecting a powerful image outward, one that communicates, if we only read it right, all this situation of his and the bitterness he felt about it. He does this with an implicit confidence that there will be viewers who will grasp the implications of what he is doing, the kind of self-presentation he is giving them, along with others who will miss the point totally and think this is the work of a forger. I hope that by now you or most of you will have joined me in thinking that this is totally impossible. My treatment of the painting in my compelling image chapter ends with this sentence, quote, On this self-created stage, Chun stands in a pose of attempted, imperfectly realized dignity looking almost out at us, almost revealing himself, but remaining finally closed in. He exemplifies in his person and his paintings the wide scope for individualism that late Ming society offered, the questioning or even undermining of tradition that was also possible at the time, and the dangers of both. His self-portrait, even as the work of an artist who found it impossible to make simple statements, is a painting of extraordinary honesty and self-awareness. If there is a better image anywhere in world art of the problematic situation of the intelligent and sensitive man in an absurd world, I do not know it." End quote. Wow, that young person could really write. Uh, next, please. Now you will all be made to gaze at Chan Hung Shou and be gazed at almost by him while I read my translation of his brief essay on painting, uh, with which I ended my other book of that time, The Distant Mountains, I decided after making my own way tortuously through that great and uh, enigmatic age of painting, to let Chun, Chun Hung Shou have, as I put it, the last word. Remember, as you listen, that basic to his dilemma was finding himself in the position of continuing a great tradition of painting, that of the Sung Masters, that had fallen into heavy decline. And that, as I've said, is in some large part what this whole painting is about. The special importance of that essay, brief as it is, is that it's a rare exception to what I've called the literary, literati artists and critics controlling the press, uh, doing all the writing that Chinese people read and that was preserved. Chen Hong Shou was able, as a learned man himself, who was not committed to the literati dogma, in fact, was quite opposed to it, was able to articulate the situation and the artistic doctrine of the professional master. Okay, now I'm going to read uh, from Chen Hong Shou's essay. Artists today do not follow the old masters, relying on a few phrases borrowed from old writings uh, to pass the official examination, that is. They embark on careers as scholar officials, perhaps attaining some trivial and transient fame for themselves. Thereupon they begin to wave the brush and do paintings. But their brushwork and ink control are not equal to the demands they place on them. And also in terms of verisimilitude, likeness that is, their paintings alas do not bear comparison with their subjects. And yet these men use their trifling fame as officials to offer their works uh, for criticism, expecting to be taken seriously as painters that is. Moreover, they ridicule and criticize other older and accomplished artists. That is what makes me, old Lotus, most dissatisfied with these illustrious gentlemen. On the other hand, why is it that the professional artists of today, when they imitate Sung painting, fail through excess of artisan skill? Uh, is it because it is because they do not encompass tongue styles along with the Sung? 
Those who imitate Yuan styles, by contrast, fail through excess of rusticity. They do not trace these styles back to their sung sources. If you can temper the stiffness of sung with the harmoniousness of tang and realize the qualities of Yuan through the order or the rightness of sung, then you will have achieved the great synthesis. Mei Gong, that is Chun Ji Ru, that was his good friend, says, and he's quoting him, Tsung artists are unable to attack fearlessly, that is to strike to the heart of things. They are not equal to the sparse or summary manner of Yuan, end quote, within the quote. But that is not a valid argument, Chun goes on. What about such Tsung period gentlemen as Zhao Lingrong, Dungran, Zhu Ran, Wang Shan, Li Gongwen, Mi Fu? Can they be called too detailed or too fussy? They were the forefathers of the Yuan masters, such as Huang Gongwang, Nizan, Wu Zhan, Gao Ke Gong, Zhao Meng Fu. When the old masters, venerating tradition, established their methods, they were never other than strict and cautious. Nizan sketchy pictures, for instance, all are carefully arranged and follow the rules. The great and later generals Li, that Li Zixun, Li Zhao Dao, Li Chang, Zhao Bo Ju, all these, even when they painted highly elaborate pictures, with a thousand gates and myriad doors, a thousand mountains and myriad streams, always gave them a harmonious air. If one regards their works open-mindedly and studies them, how can he possibly say that Sung is not the equal of Yuan? There are, to be sure, detestable painters also in the Sung. Ma Yuan and Xia Gui are really the ones who have given Sung painters a bad name. Uh, and then, last paragraph. I, old lotus, therefore exhort these illustrious gentlemen to study the old masters and to examine Sung painting exhaustively so as to arrive at the end at Yuan. I exhort the professional artists to model themselves on the Sung masters, but entreat them also to include Tang styles in their studies. If you truly immerse your mind in this way, you will attain the true lineage of painting. When dealing with the various masters, you will recognize that this kind of brushwork comes from such and such a painter, that conception comes from such and such a painter, the, generation, the generational images will not be confused, and the artists will all be lined up in order. When, after that, you begin to paint, then you can move freely over the whole world. I, old Lotus, am now 54. My hometown, the Chenton, lacks any artist who can revive the study of painting. I wipe my eyes and I wait for one to appear. Okay, that's the end of Chun Hong Shou's remarkable essay. Okay, now we go on. I introduce the next Chun Hong Shou painting we'll look at with these two photos, Cici si Wong on the left, Sherman Lee on the right, along with his longtime curator, Wai Gam Ho and Max Lur. Wang, who was, among other things, a dealer in Chinese paintings, had a Chun Hong Shou painting that Sherman wanted very much for his museum. But Wang, citing that well-known phrase that pairs Chun with his northern contemporary Cui Zhong, that is Chun in the south, Cui in the north, uh, non Chun Bei Cui, insisted on selling paintings by the two of them as a pair. Next, the work by Cui Zhong at left, which I've already shown in an earlier lecture, representing a Taoist adept traveling to heaven with his entire family, and the one by Chan Hong Shou at the right, a birthday painting that he did in 1638 for his aunt. Sherman, although he didn't especially want the Cui Zhong painting, finally bit the bullet and bought them both. Of course, he was smart to get both, because the Cui Zhong is a fine painting too. I've reproduced and discussed the Chan Hong Shou painting three times in my Fantastics and Eccentrics exhibition, My Distant Mountains, My Painter's Practice. It's not only a highly diverting painting, but it has a good story attached to it. Next. Chun Hong Shou painted this one in 1638 for the 60th birthday of his aunt, flattering her by portraying her as a learned lady of the distant past, Lady Shan Wenjun. All this is explained in detail in Chun's long inscription written at the top of the painting. A translation of that inscription by Wai Gam Ho is in the entry for this painting in the Eight Dynasties catalog. But instead of reading that, which you can find and read for yourselves, let me read from Distant Mountains, page of, top of page 249, what I wrote about this painting there. Shan Hung Shou's Lady Shan Wan 
expounding the classics, painted in 1638, is another example of his use of double imagery that overlays past on present. The painting was done as a gift for his aunt on her 60th birthday and compares her flatteringly to a learned woman of antiquity. Lady Shran Wan had been instructed by her father in the Zhou Guan, or the uh, ritual of the Zhou dynasty, a book thought to have been written by the Duke of Zhou, the regent to the first ruler of the dynasty, and an exemplar for Confucius and others of the highest virtues of that golden age. Because of its authorship, her father advised her, this classic was the best source for standards of conduct, canonical precedents, and governmental organization. She studied it diligently. Later, at a time when studies of classical texts had declined to a low state, she was summoned at the age of 80 by the king to teach her understanding of the text to 120 young scholars. Some of them are seen in Chan Hung Sho's painting, sitting in rows. Lady Shran Wan lectured from behind a curtain, which Chan Hung Sho has raised here to allow us to see her. She sits behind a screen, uh, a frail but commanding figure, with wisdom in her wrinkled prune face. The landscape painted on the screen echoes in style the landscape with which the whole painting opens in the foreground. This correspondence, besides providing another double image effect, brackets the space occupied by the fig figures. The location of that space to, in the far middle ground, as in the case of similar compositions we've considered, removes it from the realm of present reality. Where Chan exposes himself openly to the viewer's inspection in his 1635 self-portrait, he allows his aunt, or her assigned antique image, to recede decently into the distance. Such distancing in time and space is emphasized by archaistic elements of style, the long-sleeved robes and the elongated faces of the male figures, drawn from some pre-Tong model, the fungus-shaped clouds, the firmly outlined distant promontories, the additive character of the whole composition. Coloring with rich contrasting pigments gives the painting more decorative beauty than our reproduction can convey. Okay, so much for the quotation. Now back to uh, the regular lecture. Jesus, I hope I can finish this. Okay. <clears throat> Continuing. What I would like to call your attention to here and more broadly for Chan Hung Sho's paintings, is that the image of the old woman is a double image, the learned lady of classical antiquity and aunt. In my writings on Chan Hung Sho, especially in the compelling image chapter centered on him and his self-portrait, I've called attention over and over to this subtle quality of his central figural imagery, a quality that isn't peculiar to him. Wu Bin does something like it for landscape painting but is especially strong and effectively employed in the works of certain late Ming artists. Is the woman in the He Qian Zhang portrait uh, He's real concubine or an ideal picture of a woman? Answer, she is both. And the superimposed image is in itself a commentary, as we can take it to be, on the status of women in that society. How much individu individuality are they permitted to display? Next, please. Chen Hung Shou's self-portrait is at the same time an image of the ideal scholar gentleman seen with his servant in the landscape. Chun means to call up that conventional imagery and overlay it uh, onto it, his particular ironic comment on his personal situation in a debased world. Irony is perhaps the best word for the relationship between these real and ideal images. And in my compelling image chapter, I argue that behind this irony, is a dense overlay of engagement with an ideal culture of the distant past onto a bitter acceptance of their inability to recapture that ideal for their own time in its original form and with its original values intact. I deeply believe that recognizing the complexity of this overlaid imagery, as I've tried to do in various of my writings, is a key to understanding late Ming painting in a way that really gets under the surface Let's keep that complex observation in mind as we turn to the last of the Chan Hung Cho paintings that we'll look at in this lecture, his hand scroll representing the seven sages of the bamboo grove. Now, 
On to the hand scroll painting by Chun Hung Sho that is our main subject today. Uh, the, uh, the hand scroll representing the seven sages of the bamboo grove. Those of you who watched our first series on early Chinese painting will remember from the third lecture on Six Dynasties painting the designs of tomb tiles found on the walls of tombs near Nanjing representing the seven sages of the bamboo grove, actually showing them beneath trees. Chen Hongshou didn't know those images, but he did have the opportunity to see old paintings, probably mostly while he was serving briefly in the capital as a painter. Next. Some old model must underlie his painting, his placing of the seven sages in a grove of trees instead of among bamboo, as we see here in a preview of one section of his scroll at the right. Uh, also, his understanding of pre-Tong figure painting, next, uh, is clearly visible in the way he portrays the individual figures with elongated faces and robes drawn with continuous fine lines. Just as landscapists in the Orthodox school assumed a certain knowledge of antique landscape styles in their viewers and used stylistic allusions that those viewers would recognize, so Chun Hung Shou assumed some familiarity with early figure painting, even if it was only in copies and imitations in his audience. Next. And still later artists were to allude back to Chun Hung Shou, as Luo Ping does in the 1799 painting that uh, we've used for the title and ending credits for this series as an ideal image of gazing into the past. In trying to convey some sense of how these highly sophisticated allusions to old styles worked in later Chinese painting, I used to draw on my love of certain recent and contemporary French composers, notably the disciples of Satie, known as Les Six, the Six, and especially among them, Francis Poulenc and Darius Milo. They could conjure up bittersweet evocations of romantic music with tinges of popular song. The effect is hard to describe, but the musical among you will know what I mean. Uh, once when Max Lohr came to visit me while I was a student in Ann Arbor, I played for him uh, a recording I had just purchased of a Poulenc piano concerto that evoked and somewhat or semi-parodied romantic styles and music in this way. And when it was finished, Max said gravely, composers should not be allowed to write such music. And he was perfectly serious, dead serious. It was for him a desecration of the German romantic styles that he was devoted to. But enough of that. I've either convinced or conveyed my point about stylistic illusions or I haven't. On to look at the paintings. Next. But one more image before we turn to the scroll. Uh, this photograph of Walter Hochstetter, familiar already from earlier lectures about paintings that he owned. During my year as a fellow at the Metropolitan Museum, in 1953-4, to four, Walter showed me the paintings that he kept rather secretly in his New York apartment, and a special treasure among them was this Chun Hung Shou hand scroll of the Seven Sages. Here is the scroll in four sections. I'm going to show the four uh, color images uh, just as a preliminary. Walter never tried to sell the scroll, along with one other hand scroll painting he had, a Yuan Dynasty picture of horsemen, he kept it as a valuable personal possession. He permitted me to reproduce in my compelling image book three sections of it, including the crucial ending, more of it than had been published by anybody before. But he still reserved the first section, his special favorite, to publish himself. After his death, uh, his heirs put the scroll into auction at, Christi at uh, Christie's Hong Kong in autumn 2009, and it sold for a big price. But then the buyer was told by two Shanghai Museum curators, Shan Guolin and Zhong Yin Lan, that in their opinion it was not a genuine work, but a later copy. And the buyer returned it and got his money back. Hookstetter's heirs, James and Paul Zhu, who were sons of the Chinese woman that Walter lived with late in his life, wrote me asking if I would certify the genuineness of the painting, in my opinion, with a legal affidavit stating that. And I agreed. James drew that my request, as a kind of condition really, made the color images that I'm going to use in this presentation that follows. He's an amateur photographer without the professional equipment or the expertise to make photos of the kind that we're used to. Uh, and we have to make, keep that in mind while we're looking at the pictures. 
at the last minute, I, I insert here a bit of new information. Just last night, I received an email telling me that the scroll has gone back to, to the auction, this time to Sotheby's, uh, to be auctioned, perhaps in New York, Sotheby's in March, um, or at any rate, uh, in the near future. And this gives a special urgency to my effort to uh, com convince everybody that this has to be a genuine, not only genuine, but actually a very fine, even a great work by Chen Hongshou. So if you are if you are a millionaire with lots of money and you're going to this auction, buy this painting. Next. For this first of the four sections of the paintings, I'll use a black and white image. I'm sure that this is the same painting that Walter showed me back in uh, 1953 to 4, by the way, because I have good photos from that time, one of which I'll show later. This first section was Walter's favorite, and the one that he wouldn't let me reproduce when I published the other three. It shows four servants of these seven sages carrying two big pots of wine on poles over their shoulders, between and behind huge rocks, approaching the sages uh, to replenish their stock of wine. Two of the servants are seen only as heads above the rocks. Next. The upper right corner of the scroll, with what I assume is a collector's seal. The drawing is done in fine, continuous line uh, taken from antique painting. But seen close up as here, it can be seen to follow also, uh, in some places, the old nails head rat tail convention, the line being thick at one end and trailing off to a point at the other. This is only one of the many refinements that persuade me that this work cannot be a fake or copy. Next, please. I can see why Walter liked this opening so much. The rocks are shaped in strong sculptural ways with line and graded washes and some brown and bluish color. Showing only the upper parts of the servants is a play on another old convention by which the principal figures were revealed completely and lesser ones partly hidden. Next. The comically low-class faces of the servants with their doleful expressions are another of the painting's charms. There's some interior drawing on the rocks along with the washes. Nothing done by Chan Hong Shou is merely routine or conventional. Next, please. The setting of the forest with its grotesquely twisted and knotty old trees, bunches of flowers, and rows of bright blue grasses on the ground. Also the beginning of the bamboo grove, seen between the trees and middle distance. Playful archaism in figures is one thing, and understandable, but playful archaism in landscape elements is quite another, and hard to understand how he did it, that is. Nothing could be further, more different, I mean, from the uh, earnest imitations of old landscape styles, uh, the type called Fang, that was practiced at this time by Dong Chi Chang and his literati followers. Uh, the, the varied coloring of the trees is part of the highly formal, artificial, but elusive air of the whole picture. Even the mist changes color from white to pale red-brown and back to white as it drift, drifts through the bamboo. The grotesque forms and surfaces of the trees somehow recall the exposed bone and muscle structures of organic things that have grown old and, and uh, emaciated. I could go on, end, uh, go on endlessly trying to articulate some of the multi-layered elusiveness of this painting. Next, please. Rolling on, we see the first two of the seven sages. One of them, sitting on a rock and turning to look leftward, one hand on his knee, holds a musical instrument, mostly hidden, but probably the yuan, a lute-like plucked instrument. Next. The same figure is seen closer. Even within this exaggeratedly antique style of drawing, Chan Hung Shou manages to suggest solid bodies beneath the heavy robes, a feature more of his own time than of true antiquity, when they mostly would have been bodiless with the robes occupying space, but without any sense of real bodies beneath them. There are exceptions, but mostly that was true. Next. The next section, revealing the first three of the seven sages and the stone table in the clearing around which they have gathered. The second sage is back to us, holds a fan in one hand and a wine cup in the other. Their clothing is loosened, and they sit uh, in what is meant to be relaxed postures, expressive of their untrammeled ease, their escape from the constraints of society. A big green wine pot with the handle of a ladle protruding from its mouth is on the table before them. Next. The third of the seven sages lies comfortably 
on the stone table, his back resting against a raised section of natural stone placed for that purpose at one end. One arm and one leg are draped over a long staff, the other leg turned upward with a foot showing, the other arm with hands stretched out, pressed against the stone table, bearing some of his weight. His red sandals are placed on the ground before him. His long hair spills over his shoulders. Notice, by the way, the bamboo stalks above his head and to the left. Do they look odd, curiously lacking in variety and in interest? We will see why in a moment. But let me insert here, next. Early in the chapter on Shunning Show in my compelling image book, I reproduced these two pictures together. The lower one is, of course, one of the seven sages from the 5th century tomb near Nanjing. The upper image is a self-portrait that Chan Hung Shou painted as one leaf in an album fairly early in his career in 1627 with a long inscription that I partly translate there. The sprawled archaistic figure with its real sense of an articulated body beneath the clothing, unlike so many other human figures in the 6th dynasty's painting and pictorial designs, I said, is a type that Chan Hung Shou seems to have known about not from these tomb murals, which he couldn't have seen, but from some other source. The oddly bent, reclining figure of Chun's third sage follows this type, with more of the body exposed. Next, we'll go back to that. The next section of the scroll reveals the fourth and fifth of the seven sages. But before I speak of them, let me talk of the rows of stiffly upright bamboo stalks above them in the distance, continuing the ones we saw above the third sage. How could Chan Hung Shou's unfailing ability to make diverting the variety, even within repetitive passages, have failed him so badly here? Next. The answer is, it didn't. That's not the hand of Chan Hung Shou at work, up there, but the hand of Walter Hochstetter, along with the hand of his Hong Kong mounter, probably. Walter, as I related before, had the very bad habit of altering paintings to change or remove places he didn't like. He always claimed that he was really restoring the painting to its original form, taking out a place that had been added, but uh, that wasn't true in many cases, or most cases. And in this case, as he told me on showing me the painting, he disliked the mist that originally wound its way through this middle distance bamboo grove, as you can see in the photograph, and simply removed it, or not so simply, rather laboriously, and replaced it with the what seems to me at least dull, repetitive series of bamboo stalks. When Elizabeth Hammer of Christie's uh, wrote to tell me that they were putting the scroll into auction, uh, I immediately wrote back to her to inform her of this change and to recommend that she get access to the original photos of it that I had received from Walter uh, and were still in the department files and reproduce those in the catalog also. To her great credit, she did this. Uh, taking a lot of trouble to find, with some help from Pat Berger, the mounted photos in our old photo archive uh, in Doe Library, no longer in use and stored in an obscure place. My point is that the purchaser of the scroll should know about this alteration and be able to make the decision whether to attempt to restore it to its original form, uh, but that would be difficult and probably unwise. Anyway, she did find and copy the old photos and reproduce them, this one with the, in her catalog. I now have the photos myself, and I preserve them for future Shun Hung Shou scholars as important documents. I don't uh, like this alteration of Walter's, but I don't think that it changes or hurts the, this wonderful scroll enough to make it any less worth owning. I insert that for any possible buyer. Uh, next, please. Returning to look at the fourth of the seven sages, he sits on the ground, turned back toward the others, flowers in his hair, holding what appears to be a wine ladle and leaning back against a bundle of scrolls, of which only the ends are seen. Under him is a kind of animal skin, of which only the protruding edges can be seen. A flowing stream has appeared behind him, separating him from the bamboo grove. If we were to look back, we would see it as a pale blue strip behind the first three sages, unnoticed before. Next. The flowing water takes on more prominence as we roll further. Another tall tree appears, and behind it we glimpse the fifth sage. But before we turn to him, let's gaze once more at the dull, repetitive grove of bamboo stalks up above, which Walter somehow preferred to Chan Hung Shou's original, more interesting image of 
uh, the bamboo grove with mist drifting through it. Curse you, Walter, for doing this. Next, please. But enough of that. The section of the scroll that follows introduces more foreground trees, as interestingly bizarre as the one seen earlier in the scroll. Two of these, the closest ones, have elaborately imagined root structures. The fifth and sixth of the seven sages are mostly hidden behind these trees, with only their upper faces and parts of their bodies seen around them. The fifth sage simply sits leaning forward, listening intently to the music played by the others, which is always in such scenes we have to imagine as blending in a way that they felt or knew to be cosmically significant in a Taoist way, blending with the natural sounds of the running stream, the wind in the trees. Next. The sixth sage is playing a chin or zither, his right hand touching the strings, his left hand resting on his right wrist. Next. Moving on to the next section, we have seen six sages and are, of course, anticipating the seventh. But Chan Hung Shou makes us wait for a while, while he shows us more trees nearer and further, more odd flowering plants growing from the ground. At the top, our gaze is drawn back more and more into depth, with masses of foliage hanging and trees and bamboo stalks growing up at further and further distance. Next. The trees close up. As I was saying before, Chan Hung Shou's highly idiosyncratic way of treating plant and animal forms so that the plant seemed capable of animation almost with musculature and bones, as if, imparts a strange ambiguity to our visual responses to these images. We lean toward misreading them, then correct ourselves, and the back and forth gives depth to the experience. Next. The arrival of the seventh sage is put off still longer, as quieter spaces follow the busy ones. The stream broadens. A few of the bamboo stalks move into the middle ground and are seen complete, with their twigs and leaves spread out in large, flat patterns. Next. And the thatched top of a tingza, or kiosk, protrudes from the lower margin of the scroll, implying a complete structure, complete building down below, unseen. What appears to be rose vines in bloom wind around its top, uh, with tiny spiraling tendrils that hold our attention for a moment, before it is abruptly shifted to, next please, the seventh sage, seen at last. But he appears not to be moving confidently forward to join the others. He stands alone, his cloak drooping around him, a would-be seventh sage uncertain about how he will be received by the others. And he is depicted in a way quite different from the unambiguous archaism of the others. As an image, and especially his face, has a strange air of contemporary presence and a strange sense of someone who doesn't quite know what he is doing there and feels awkward about it. Next. So who is he really? A question for which the right answer cannot be simple and cannot be stated quickly. My belief, expressed in my treatment of this painting in my compelling image book, is that he probably represents on some level the person for whom Chun Hung Shou painted the scroll identified in his inscription as Taoist Che Chen, uh, we are confronted here, that is, with another double image, like Chen Hung Shou's self-portrait or his picture of his aunt, in which the portrayal of a real living person is superimposed on or merged with the conventional image of an ideal figure from antiquity. Next, please. The last section with Chen Hung Shou's brief inscription, a dedication reading, Old Lotus that's Chun's name for himself, for Taoist Che Chen has imitated the Tang masters, end quote. Meaning painters of antiquity, he was not really specifying Tang as distinct from pre-Tang. While we gaze longer at this unexpected and profoundly puzzling and moving ending to what presents itself as a painting of the Seven Sages of the Bamboo Grove, let me read what I wrote about it in my compelling image book. Four of the sages form a group in the central section. As we roll further, we find two more partly hidden behind trees. The fantastic elaboration of roots and knotty trunks, the succession of decorative foliage patterns, are Chen Hong Shou's exaggerated versions of forms that he saw in antique paintings, or very probably in imitations and forgeries of antique paintings. They serve here to characterize the human figures with which they are visually compacted, 
attributing to them qualities of unconventionality and antique crotchetiness, along with the sterner virtues that twisted old trees stood for. At the end of the scroll stands the seventh sage, or at least someone who seems to want to join the other six. He stands in a rather dejected pose, wearing a cape and straw hat that are supposed to give him the aspect of a carefree wanderer, but in fact make him look slightly absurd. He is portrayed in a mode quite different from the others, and strongly suggests, especially since he turns his eyes to look out at us, that Chunhung Shou has inserted a portrait of some friend in place of one of the seven sages. It is probably the unidentified Daoist Che Chen to whom Shun dedicates the scroll and his inscription at the end. I want to use this remarkable painting, my own long-time engagement with it, and the present occasion for returning once more to that engagement to try to articulate what I think the role of the art historian should be. I always told my serious students in seminars that our main task on the highest level is answering for this or that work of art or body of art the question, what is the artist up to? That was a brief and swangy way of, uh, of conveying, I think, essentially the same message as Baxendall conveys in the crucial arguments of his book, Patterns of Intention. Uh, penetrating and articulating the artist's intention is the deepest responsibility of the art historian. But conveying what the artist is up to requires imparting lots of information, and not just factual information, to one's readers and viewers. What did viewers of the artist's time, sophisticated ones, the, the kinds that the, an artist like Chan Hung Shou painted for, what did they expect to get in the paintings they commissioned? What was in their st stores of memories of paintings they had seen? What visual knowledge and memories, that is, could Chan Hung Shou count on in the viewers that he was working for? Uh, he did some popular paintings along with his assistants, pictures for use and pleasure, to coin a phrase, uh, done for that greater mass of Chinese viewers outside the literati male minority. But much of his patronage, necessarily given his situation and the nature of the society around him, came from those literati males with their mental storage addicts, full of imagery and stylistic memories from their long experience of looking at old and new paintings. And the Taoist Che Chen of Chun's dedicatory inscription, whoever he was, was surely one of those. And Chun Hung Shou could please him, flatter him, by doing a work for him that presupposed such memories, a work that drew on them and played on them in a way they assumed that assumed them in his patron. So where does that leave your old scholar lecturer? In a position where he must, to fulfill his responsibility toward those sensitive and intelligent viewers out there who would like to respond in a knowing way to these great paintings from a far distant culture, in much the same way they all can already respond to literature and music and Western art on levels that depend on programs built into their brains, they want me, that is, to fill them in with pictures and words so that they will be able to respond more fully to what a complex artist like Chan Hung Shou was up to, so to speak. And the degree of success I can claim for a lecture like this one is, in the end, the degree to which I have managed to convey in images and words what Chan Hung Shou was doing for Dallas Che Chan that pleased that patron and upheld Chan's re reputation as an artist who could be relied on to do that for his customers and patrons. And that final statement once made seems to me so basic and valuable as a statement of what I've been up to, or tried to be up to, throughout much of my long career as an art historian, that I think I'll put it on my website for those of you who may want to reread it and try to understand better what I'm saying, or trying to say. So, farewell to those of my viewers, who are of course also welcome, who are video lookers only. While to, those, while to those who may follow this up by looking for this long statement and reading it on my website, goodbye for now. See you on jameskahill.info. Sincerely, James Cahill. Mm -hmm.